Hello, everyone, and welcome to the SIX Festival. Um, the festival is part of SIX, the Summer Institutes in Computational Social Science. I'm Matt Salganik, and I will be the uh, moderator of this event. The mission of the Summer Institutes in Computational Social Science is to provide open, high-quality training in computational social science to researchers around the world in order to accelerate the growth of the field and ensure that it develops practices that are in the long-term interests of science and society. Each summer since 2017, we have offered two-week summer training programs for graduate students, postdocs, and junior faculty interested in computational social science. The summer institutes offer both social scientists and data scientists, broadly construed. <clears throat> so far, we have provided this free training to more than 700 participants from around the world. The event that you are now attending is part of the first ever SIX Festival, which provides a chance for our alumni to host tutorials and participate in discussions of interest to computational social scientists. In this event, we have Dave Holtz and Sanaz Mobaseri uh, talking about opportunities and challenges with industry collaboration. I will say, of all the topics, this is one that I'm asked about the most frequently, and uh, I think we're all lucky to have such great experts here to share their wisdom with us about this topic. Um, so first, a few ground rules about how this will work. Uh, I'll be having a discussion with the panelists for about 30 to 45 minutes. Uh, then we'll move to a period of more questions that are driven by the audience. Uh, there'll be two different ways that you can ask questions. The first is you can type the questions into the Zoom chat feature. So at the bottom of your Zoom bar, uh, you, there's a button that says chat and you can just type your question into the chat feature. You can even do that as we go. Uh, also, if you'd like, you can use the Zoom raise hand feature, and then we will call on you, and then you can ask the question uh, yourself. So there'll be two ways to ask questions, and there'll be a, a, a clear moment where we transition from more of a panelist-driven event to more of a question-driven event from the audience. I want to remind everyone that this talk is being recorded, and it will be posted on the SIX Festival website, and also the SIX YouTube channel. That way, even more people can learn from the stuff that we hear about today. So with that background, uh, now let's get on to the main event. I'm really excited to introduce our two panelists. Uh, Dave Holtz is a doctoral candidate in the Information Technology Group at the MIT Sloan School of Management. He is also a member of the research team at the MIT Initiative on Digital Economy. Dave's research broadly focuses on the design of online marketplaces and platforms. Dave has experience working as a data scientist at Spotify, Facebook, Airbnb, and TrialPay. Dave participated in SIX Duke 2018. Our other panelist is Sanaz Mobaseri. She is an assistant professor of management and organization at Boston University's Questrom School of Business. Her research investigates how organizational and social network processes shape gender and race differences amongst employees at work. She does this by examining the roles of culture, cognition, and emotion in organizations using field experimental and computational research methodologies. Her research often involves collaborating with companies. Prior to graduate school, Sanaz worked in consulting and banking. Sanaz participated in SIX Duke 2018 and was a local organizer at SIX Boston 2019. So welcome, Dave and Sanaz. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you uh, for sharing your, your wisdom with us. Um, so I'd like to start, you all have a lot of experience doing industry collaborations. And so I'm wondering if you could start by giving us a sense of the landscape. Like what are the different types of industry collaborations that you've seen and participated in? Uh, sure. Um, thanks, Matt, uh, and everyone else involved first off for, for organizing uh, the SIX Festival. Um, I had a chance to tune into a couple of the other panels and they've all been really interesting and informative and it's exciting to uh, be a part of this one. Um, I, I guess I'll, I can start and say, so Sanaz and I were actually discussing this question a couple of days ago and I think we uh, kind of quickly realized that the types of collaborations that the two of us uh, engage in with, uh, with firms tend to be uh, quite different. And so um, I guess often for me, when I'm working with a company, uh, I'm usually hoping to learn something about their platform or their users. And so uh, that typically involves talking to them about, you know, if it's a tech company to say, 
um, maybe having access to their data to learn something about usage patterns or, or how people are behaving or maybe something about the broader world uh, through the usage patterns uh, on that product. Or maybe I want to run a field experiment um, to sort of see whether or not a particular mechanism has a certain type of effect. So I'm generally interested in studying the product itself or the users, um, or as I think Sana's, uh, you know, I'll, I'll let her describe what she does, but, but I think her, her focus is usually a little bit different on that. Yeah. Um, so most of my work, I'm actually trying to study the company itself or the organization itself and its employees. And you could think about that um, in a couple ways. So either I'm looking to experiment something there and the organizational is, site is the field site, um, or I'm looking to get access to archival data that they have or that they might be generate in the process of generating so that I can study that. Um, there's sort of another version of organizational collaboration where maybe they create a, a tool that companies use and in that case, I might be interested in working with the company to study one of their clients for some sort of collaboration tool. Um, so that's kind of the scope of the kinds of collaborations that I do. Interesting. That's a really helpful difference between studying the organization and studying, let's say, the product or the users. So I'm wondering, for, for people interested in going one of those approaches, what are some different ways that collaboration with industry can get started? Uh, I can... Yeah, I, I, I think Dave and I also have slightly different ways of approaching this. Um, if you are famous, I think cold calling can be really effective. Uh, I, that is in many time, in many cases, not the, not everyone's experience. Um, for me, I, in grad school, was really encouraged by my advisors and sort of, I guess, the Bay Area environment to go to a lot of meetups and conferences or events where people who were interested in the topics that I study, which is race, gender, diversity, um, where everyone would be in attendance. And from early, like at an early point in my doctoral program, I was encouraged to start pitching ideas like, oh, I'm thinking about studying this for my dissertation. Um, and I did that in these sort of small, like five or 10 minute slots. Um, so it was a lot of informal networking and uh, things progressed from there. I've also given talks to like multidisciplinary audiences where people come up to you afterwards and they say, hey, we run a culture survey. We would love to talk with you about it. And could you help us analyze it? And that um, can sometimes be the starting point for collaboration as well. I've also tried uh, targeting um, old employers and clients in, from my past career and asking them if they'd be interested in collaborating. And sort of the problem is uh, it takes some work to get on the same page about like what's in it for everyone. So that approach, you know, saying like, I definitely want to study this company based in Berlin. That's hard to do, uh, at least at this phase in my career. Um, yeah, I, I think I would echo uh, Sana's point that networking can, can be pretty effective. Um, and so for me, uh, I guess I'm fortunate in that because I used to work in tech um, and because a lot of my research is kind of tech adjacent, uh, I have definitely drawn on that pre-existing network uh, to get some of my collaboration started. So for instance, um, I have a working paper uh, with Airbnb that looks at experiment design in online marketplaces. And that particular paper is a direct extension of things that I was working on uh, when I was still an employee there. And so I was able to go back, you know, a couple of years into school and reach out to people that I knew and say, hey, I'm working on this thing that you might be interested in can I come show you some early results? Would you maybe wanna you know, engage in some sort of collaboration? Um, I think it's worth noting that one downside of, I guess the utility of networking is that if you're someone that comes from a background that just doesn't give you access to those types of networks, either because of where you live or you know, because those networks tend to be, you know, let's say like predominantly white or something like that, that can be a barrier, uh, which is not good. Um, I guess another uh, sort of entry point um, if you're a PhD student is to do uh, internships. And so uh, a couple of my collaborations have started out, I guess I have some work with Facebook and also the work I have with Spotify. You know, I applied for these summer internships and I, uh, you know, started working on projects there and then they've kind of extended beyond the internship. Um, 
And so I think this can be effective for sort of creating those networks yourself and, and getting a foot in the door and maybe starting out on a project that you otherwise wouldn't have had access to. Um, there are definitely downsides to this kind of internship model in terms of, I would say some of the um, like legal and sort of, um, yeah, mainly legal issues around, um, you know, your rights to definitely publish what you work on and things like that, which are, are definitely things that academics, you know, might not want to sacrifice. And so there's kind of a, there are pros and cons, I guess, to, to that approach in particular. Can I just add uh, one more thing? I don't want, um, to the network's point, I had a collaboration once get started with a co-author who met the person in like a parent group. Um, and I just want to normalize talk, you know, in different spaces saying, yeah, I'm interested in working and collaborating with companies and that's part of my research approach because that just makes like opens up the conversation. It can happen in any setting. It doesn't have to be at like an exclusive conference or at an industry event that you might not have access to. Um, I also wanted to say that actually a lot of students, uh, if you teach in a grad program or you teach any kind of like MBA students are uh, very often willing to connect you with people who might um, be interested in some sort of research collaboration where they're working. Sorry, I'm done, Matt. All right, awesome. So I think we heard a couple different ideas about kind of how you can get your foot in the door, how you can meet someone and begin a conversation. But then I was wondering if you could tell me more about the next step. So you're having coffee with someone inside of a company. You have a, how often do you come with a fully formed project to pitch? How often are they pitching to you? Like what are some of the next steps as you start to begin the process of figuring out if this is gonna be a successful collaboration and what that collaboration might look like? uh yeah um i think this probably varies a lot depending on uh your your relationship with the company and things like that um and i'm sure sanas has a unique perspective as well i i guess drawing on experience um this project i mentioned with airbnb was a case where i went in and i had a very specific um idea and it turned out to be the case that it was also very interesting to them and so i essentially went in with a fully fledged proposal and they were pretty okay with it and we tried to um sort of push it through um but i i think that normally uh especially if you're not as familiar with the people that you might be working with there is this kind of uh you know calibration process maybe where you might go in with the question that you think is the most purely interesting from an academic perspective and it might be the case that that particular question is um, not interesting to uh, the company uh, because you know maybe there's not any potential for them to sort of you know like make a profit off of this idea or it's just not high priority on the roadmap or something like that and so I think one of the things that you can try to do in these early conversations is to get an idea of what they find interesting and and then try to find you know in that venn diagram of what you think is interesting and what you they think is interesting what's in the the overlap region so um i know right now i'm kind of in the early stages of talking to a firm about a collaboration that i've not worked with before and so you know the way that's worked is i sort of went in and told them what i think is interesting they gave me a set of things that they think are interesting or they want to work on and maybe they don't have the bandwidth to do um, and we've sort of tried to find common ground. Um, so it sounds like looking for that overlap of what they want to do and what you want to do is a is a big part of it. Is Sanaz, is that your experience as well? Yeah, um, so I want to echo what Dave said because it resonates with my experience as well. Um, I would encourage people to not spend a lot of time detailing a specific research question before you start to have these conversations because um, unless you have the benefit of working with partners who are researchers who, ha who, who have experience with it, you're probably not using the same language. So there's this whole like just getting into a shared meaning 
space, making sure you even understand each other when you're talking about research ideas. For me, that process can take anywhere from three to six months. And it looks something like we have 30 minutes to an hour on the phone every couple weeks. And we're kind of iterating on what's interesting uh, for the company and what's interesting for me. And they might suggest something where I'm like, well, let me go look at the research and actually see if there's anything that we could extend in this domain. Um, so there's this back and forth. It has never taken me less than three months to do that. Um, that's why I think for some of like Dave's internship route suggestions, you can do it faster. Um, but in my experience, it takes a couple months. Um, I, we can, do you want us to keep going with the process or just start? Sure. I think that's great. Uh, a great a point to continue on about how this kind of I think Dave called it calibration and you're calling it iteration, trying to find the space within, you know, what you want to do, what they want to do and what's possible. I mean, yeah. from an out, as an outsider, how do you even know what's possible for them to do? So you uh, don't. And I'm oh, sorry. And, and I, oh, no, I think no. that's, I think that's exciting. I just, um, I guess in case people, it, sometimes people feel more comfortable having like prepared materials when they go to these meetings. I have at times put short slide decks together that look like the front end of a research talk where you're sort of like, based on my discipline or area of study, we know these things about this behavior that we're talking about. And here's kind of what we don't know. And you leave that last slide open and you're like, what can we learn from this site or what's interesting to you of, of what's unknown? Um, that can be a nice starting point. Um, then after you figure out like, oh, maybe we want to study race and gender and we want to study where people are physically assigned to office locations. Let's say that's the topic. Then there's this whole second wave of, well, what data exists around that and who within that organization controls that? Um, your sponsor might be closely related to your interests, but it's, you know, there are multiple stakeholders involved. Um, you may, and then, then there's this other process of, I may say, oh, okay, they tell you the offices are randomly assigned and you're like, great, that's so great from a research perspective. And then you find out that, you know, they didn't mean randomly assigned in the way that you wanted them to mean it. So there's also just like linguistic calibration, a lot of back and forth. I had a case once where, you know, we were like so excited to get performance reviews and then we find uh, that you know, oh, nobody really uses that system. And actually we have this like secondary system that's informal. <laughs> and you're like, well, why did I waste all this time trying to get this data? So the figuring out what data exists, who controls it, um, what's possible to obtain, that takes another three to six months. And it's a lot of calls that your sponsor might connect you with other parts of their organization. And at the end, it's really important to say, would you be willing, like, is it a huge time commitment for someone in your department to provide us with this data at X, you know, at this moment in time and maybe answer questions about it if we have it? Because it, it's a multi, it's going to take lots of people to actually produce data that you'll be able to study. Yeah, I, I agree with all that. Um, I, there were a couple of things that I, I wanted to add um i guess one thing and maybe we'll get back to this as sort of like a separate discussion point but i i do just want to highlight that there are also definitely cases where you have these preliminary sort of calibration discussions or maybe even before having those conversations you realize that the particular questions that you want to study are just not questions that uh it makes sense to work in collaboration with a company uh and so for instance if you look at the literature on um you know, say like discrimination on platforms and there have been people, like I think there's this um, paper by Edelman and Luca and co-authors where they essentially do an audit study on Airbnb and they change the race of the people who are requesting to stay in the homes and they see whether or not there's discrimination on the platform. Like that is a study that you're probably never going to get a company to collaborate with you to do. And so if that's something that's interesting to you, there are usually research designs that you can come up with that allow you to do that externally. And so I think maybe a good prerequisite to all of this is to like think for a moment for the thing that I'm interested in doing is collaboration with the company, even the right thing to do. Um, I guess the other thing that I try to keep in mind and, and it's hard um, because for people in our position, publishing is super important <laughs> and, you know, uh, like uh, job hiring decisions or tenure decisions depend on having papers. 
but in many cases, uh, what you are working on is very low priority for the people in the company. Like you think about them, they have their quarterly reviews or they have whatever fires that are going on. And, um, and so it can be tough to, I, I guess some of these things that Sanas was talking about, about figuring out what's in the data or trying to get access to new data that you need. Um, I think these things, you know, the, the turnaround times can often be quite slow. Uh, you can sort of find yourself waiting for a week or two weeks to hear back about an email. You sometimes need to kind of follow up many times because these collaborators have a lot of other things uh, going on. And I, I guess one thing that I've found, and this maybe um, goes without saying, is that uh, it's always harder than you think it's going to be. So the data is kind of always messier than you think it's going to be. And I think especially uh, for work that's done uh, in collaboration with tech companies, I think sometimes academics, you know, we sort of imagine that there's this like black box that is like Google or something <laughs> and they have like super clean, amazing data. And if we could just get access to the data, we'd be able to answer all these social science questions that we have. And once you actually get behind the curtain and see the data, uh, you realize that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And so uh, figuring out how to clean that data, understanding a lot of the idiosyncratic things that go into creating that data that is that are just sort of tacit knowledge within a firm, but are kind of hard to communicate to an external person uh, can add a lot of, you know, difficulty and overhead, I guess. Thanks, Dave. There's uh, two themes. Oh, Sanaz wants to pick up on those themes, I think, <laughs> about uh, like what pro what kinds of things are not appropriate to studying with collaboration oh. and then what are some of the difficulties? Like, as Dave said, a lot of people have this idea that the everything is going to be perfect and then they run into so all kinds of problems. Actually, I loved a lot of Dave's answer and I wanted to just give the, I wanted to highlight one thing and then maybe answer a slightly different question. Mm -hmm. um, in my experience, about two thirds of the conversations that I start don't go anywhere. And I've gotten better in the sense that I will have a couple calls and then it just fades and I've gotten better at pulling the plug early. So if it, you know, that should hopefully, I say that so that it's not discouraging if that happens to other people. And it's smart to make a choice to walk away from a project that is having a hard time getting off the ground or they don't seem that committed or interested. That's not going to be great for you in the long term because that's just the beginning of the work. So I would walk away um, if you're, if it seems like they're not, if your incentives aren't aligned. Um, I did, I did want to say, I really liked what Dave was saying about the quality of the data. Just before that, we sort of we said there's this iterative process where you figure out what it is that the study is going to be about. Let's say that takes three to nine months. Um, then there's this whole uh, sort of scoping out for the legal, like legal approval, risk review. There's a lot of internal processes on both sides, um, which we can talk about. I just wanted to highlight timetable wise, that could also take another six months or longer. But for me, it's on average been around six months. And then after that, um, let's say you start to get the data. There's a whole set of things you do to prepare yourself to receive it. But what Dave said that really resonated was it has taken me on one project an additional six to nine months just to get the right data. So we thought we had the right data. Then you start to look at it. And we've had four back and forth since then. And that's just, that's just, you know, that's just how it goes. So the timetable can be quite long, but yeah, satisfying um, in the end. <laughs> yeah, I can hop into that uh, to add two quick things. So one is um, th there are definitely different sort of data custody models, I guess, and, and yeah. this is maybe a very like specific thing. But you know, there are cases where the company says we'll send you, you know, uh, not a CSV usually, but you know, we'll send you the data somehow, and that needs to be stored on a secure server or something and you can keep it at your institution. And so there, there might be more back and forth of, you know, they send the data, you look at it. If it's not the right data, you send it back, uh, so on and so forth. Um, I've also been in a lot of situations where companies will say, we'll send you uh, like a laptop and this is your laptop that gives you access to Airbnb data or something. And this is the only entry point uh, to access our data. Um, you know, you can't move the data off this laptop. This is basically, you know, the, the confidential laptop with all the data. Um, and I guess this is kind of nice in that you generally have a little more free access to the database and, you know, usually your permissions are restricted to some extent, but, you know, you don't need to necessarily 
go through this process all the time. Uh, but uh, I, this is silly, but you know, I've been in situations where I'm carrying around like two or three laptops and going through like TSA with four <laughs> laptops in my bag. And I'm sure the people are like, what is this guy doing with all these laptops? <laughs> so there can actually be a, a physical burden of working with different companies and having all these laptops. Um, I guess the other thing, and uh, this might be something that we talk about in more depth later is that, you know, Sanas is right, and we're mentioning these timelines where it's, you know, three to six months to have these preliminary conversations, then it's three to six months to get lawyers on the same page and get the agreements uh, sorted out. And one thing that can happen, and it's actually quite stressful, is that um, you think about the average tenure of people in a given workplace, um, and especially in tech, I guess, where I work, and I think this is becoming more common in other fields as well, you know, people are maybe at a firm for like two years and then they usually take on a new job. And so you can have an advocate inside who's totally on board with your project. And then over the course of working out all these things, maybe uh, your advocate leaves or the team leadership who had signed off on the project leave. And so you can end up in this situation where, um, you know, on day one, uh, the organization was very excited about your project. And then a year into it, someone is like, wait, we're doing this research collaboration with who? And they're studying what? Like, I don't want to do that. Like, we need to stop this somehow. Um, and so that is also a challenge. Like, I, I think, you know, you can sort of think about I'm collaborating with X company and that's kind of like an entity whose preferences will be consistent over time. Uh, but those actually change uh, quite a bit depending on, I guess, just who's working there and what their preferences are. As you start now moving into talking about things like the magic laptop um, and how you start negotiating the legal agreements, um, I think this might be a good chance maybe for you all to talk about your six project, the project that you did while you're at the summer institutes, because there you have a project that you've worked on through various stages and you can talk some about the timeline. Uh, this project began in 2018. Um, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about that research project and walk us through that. Also, I know there are questions coming in on the chat, which is great. Um, we'll have a chance to go to the questions probably after we hear a little bit about this particular project, because I think it's a window into a lot of the issues that researchers have to deal with as they work through a project themselves. Dave, you want to start talk about the launch and I can talk about some of the cross university collaboration issues we faced. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I guess I do want to, I think it's worth saying that, you know, the way this project sort of came about um, is at six, um, you know, at least uh, in 2018, there was this sort of process of trying to determine smaller subgroups of people that were interested in similar projects that could work on these sort of second week capstone projects. and um, I uh, had a pre-existing relationship with a, a company and uh, had sort of been ideating about potential ways to do some sort of research uh, with that company. And basically I, I had worked in the past uh, with the CEO of the company. And so I sort of said to a bunch of people at Six who seemed to have related interests, you know, hey, I think I can maybe get us access to this data uh, from this company. Here's what they do. Um, are people interested? And, uh, you know, a number of people are interested and that's sort of the how the project started um and so i think we sort of quickly went through the first stage of this kind of calibration process where we um you know my uh i guess my friend who is at the company is um you know a good friend and so we were able to quickly hop on the phone and explain what we wanted to do and what we were generally interested in and uh and they were very supportive and interested but you know if you didn't go in with this prior that the person will be very interested that it could have stopped right there. They could have been like, oh, like sounds interesting, but we don't have the time. Um, uh, but after that, I mean, we, it's two years later now, and I would say we only uh, kind of started working on the project in a, in a data way, um, maybe a year ago or something like that, um, maybe even less. And less there was than a year ago. Yeah, and there was a really lengthy process in terms of um, getting access to the data, uh, filling out IRB, um, as Sana has alluded to, getting sort of like cross-institution uh, collaboration things put in place. And uh, I'll let Sana kind of 
<laughs> talk about, I mean, I can talk about some of that too, but th yeah. there's been, there, there's a ton of um, just logistical work that goes up front before you even start doing any uh, science, I guess. Let me, I'll try to be brief, which I think we've not been successful at so far. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, it's a cool project. Um, so it allows us to study gender in an interviewing environment that's face blind and anonymous. So it's got some cool features and unlike other studies, we're able to observe what people are actually coding in the, it's a technical interview so we can see what they're coding in the interview and we can have recordings of them. So that's awesome from an analytical perspective. When we started it at six, we quickly signed an NDA because we were ideating and working with like samples of data and just trying to see what was possible. Um, then we thought it would be really quick to get the through legal, but because we are coordinating across multiple universities, it was very hard, uh, much harder than I had anticipated to agree, get like a data usage agreement and get even figure out the right way to do IRB. Like does Princeton need a separate IRB? Does BU need an IRB? Does MIT need an IRB? And all that is time consuming. So that was a real holdup, I think for us. Um, my recommendation, I know this is live, I think I'm comfortable saying this in a recorded talk, is that you, it, it has worked best for me to become an affiliate of the university and then have one university manage the like IRB and the legal agreement. That's just a lot easier if you're working with a big team. Um, that's what I've done with some of my other projects. In terms of, I mean, once it just getting it to be you, then getting everyone accounts and getting them access and the system being different than what they were familiar with. Like all that stuff takes a couple of weeks and a lot of IT tickets. So uh, that was painful. But some of the upside is like in the process, I've learned a lot from, we didn't even mention our collaborators, uh, Janet Shu and Zanale, whose last name I'm going to butcher. Dave, do you want to say Munua. it? Munua. Okay. I think, um, yeah. But I would like, the project remains unlike any of my others in that I've learned so much from the team and it's non-hierarchical, which is also different than a lot of the teams I think I worked on before where it was like professors and students. Uh, so it's been, it's been awesome. It's just taken us longer and sometimes momentum is the slow moment, like lack of momentum has been deflating, but we're there. I, I guess actually it's also worth saying once we got some of the data, the quality, like we were super excited to get audio and then when we got it, it like it didn't have, we didn't, we weren't able to do with it what we thought we were going to be able to do. We're still working on that. So it's been a lot of setbacks. Takes yeah. persistence. Yeah, quick quick plug for the paper if you're if you're interested. <laughs> we we have early results that are being presented at IC2S2. Uh, I'm guessing there's a lot of overlap between this panel and the IC2S2 crowd. Um, what, one Wait, we uh, can put that in the chat, uh, Dave. What's the title? Uh, what is the title? Is it on your website? The, it's cracking the co cracking oh. the coding interview. Dave is the first part of the title. Like all interesting okay. papers, it's a two part title. Yeah, it's cracking the coding interview colon and then something. Uh, we'll, we'll All right, I put we'll that in the that chat. Out. Everyone can Google that and see if they can find it. Um, yeah. um, what we will do is that. we'll collect up some links from the speakers about anything they'd like to share with you. And then at the end of the uh, talk, we'll send out a feedback form to you and we'll include some of the links from the papers that the speakers have mentioned. Um, well, one thing that I, I'm realizing that we've mentioned a few times in passing, but haven't been like super explicit about, and maybe uh, people who don't have familiarity with this type of collaboration wouldn't know about is um, these sort of data usage agreements. And mm -hmm. this is something that's probably important to go into. So, you know, um, NDAs are their own thing. And so maybe if you're going on site at a company or if you're having a preliminary conversation about research, you might sign an NDA. Um, and that can be useful, I think, both ways in a sense and that, uh, you know, you maybe share some information with them about what you're thinking about or what you're working on. And, and similarly, they will share information with you and, you know, both parties maybe don't want that to be super public. Um, a data usage agreement is sort of a second document that's going to govern the terms of how you can use the data, uh, what you can do uh, in terms of publishing the data, uh, things like that. And so um, I think that at least in the MIT case, I think that the, the main sticking point and the important part of this data usage agreement has to do with uh, IP ownership and then uh, also with your rights to publish. Um, and so if you think about the interests of the two different parties here, 
uh, the companies generally want to have a lot of authority to sort of say, hey, if there's anything in this paper that uh, we don't want in the paper, we want to have the ability to strike it out. Um, and then the university's interests start to say, hey, we're doing science. Uh, we want to be able to go in and publish whatever we want to publish, uh, regardless of whether or not you think that it's good from a PR perspective or if you think that it's a misrepresentation or whatever. And so there's kind of inevitably a back and forth and there are good reasons that both sides, uh, you know, have the interest that they do. Um, I think that when you're working on this, uh, I, I think certain universities just won't let you sign a data usage agreement if it doesn't have certain provisions in it. But I think it's also worth thinking about as a researcher, just how comfortable are you with being at different points uh, in the spectrum. So like I mentioned, uh, unfortunately, a lot of the times when you go into these research collaborations through an internship, uh, there's no chance of signing a data usage agreement like that because the internship is a sort of normal looking employment agreement. And so uh, a lot of my internship projects, I, you know, these projects then later on have to go through review by um, PR teams and communication teams and legal teams and product teams and all these teams uh, need to sign off on what's in the paper, which can add another long delay. Uh, can be really frustrating, uh, you know, it, that can be an additional hurdle. Um, but, you know, there are, I guess, uh, more subtle versions of this where, you know, maybe you sign something that says, hey, uh, we can publish whatever findings, but the company can go in and remove anything that is, um, you know, confidential or might uh, be material for sort of like financial purposes if it's a public company or a company that might go public and things like that. So. Uh, this has maybe been kind of rambly and, and not super clear, but th there's a lot of, you know, it's a, it's a negotiation and I think you kind of decide whether or not it's worth conceding certain points in order to work on a project that might be really important. Can I ask a follow up? There's a question from the audience by Simon about just this issue about how you negotiate this right to publish. I know Sanaz, you've thought, I've heard you describe it more as a continuum. And so I'm wondering how you negotiate this in your work. So I, uh, Dave, I totally followed everything you said. I want to affirm. Uh, I, I had a, a slightly different experience. So it's less contentious around right to publish, but there, there are a lot of things I want to say. So um, the NDA you sign immediately. I think that's a great idea. The DUA, um, you might also call it a memorandum of understanding, an MOU. It doesn't have to be a big, long legal document. You don't necessarily need to start from a template. I've done two page MOUs that have totally worked. In my, what I care about is um, the description of the site or the, you know, that that we are containing what the company needs to approve before it is like I can submit it to a conference or submit it for publication. So in my case, I like to pre-specify that. Like it's gonna be one paragraph. I'm gonna give you 100%, you, you can edit it, you can push back, you can veto it until we agree on that one paragraph. But everything else is outside of the purview of your like uh, review, right to review. So that's important for me, that didn't make sense Hopefully it'll come through. Um, the other one is the process of approval, like how far in advance do they need to see your paper before you can submit it to a conference. I almost always do things at the last minute. So if you need like a 30 day window, that's really hard for me. Um, and then also how the data is gonna be securely stored, who's responsible for it and how long you can have it before you have to kill it. So these projects take a long time. So three years is not enough time. I would go five plus if you can. And that sometimes sounds like a long time, but it's just, the scope of research. The other thing we forgot to say is at the beginning of these conversations, your or institution probably has some sort of like slide that IT or someone who does research support has about how well equipped your university is to um, securely store data and to handle whatever it is you're proposing to do. That's important to have up front to make your partners or your sites feel comfortable. Um, I forgot to say that I always have that. I always share that early on so that they don't think I'm just going to download it in my, on my home laptop and like play around with it. Yeah, and, and it's also worth stating, I guess, that most, I think most universities would have, you know, a legal office that can help oh. with these agreements. Uh, yeah. So you're, you're not like on your own trying to yeah. figure out how to draft an MOU or a, a DUA. Uh, and, and, let's, and, 
Could you just oh. clarify help? Could you clarify help? <laughs> and, and can we talk? Yeah, could you, could you clarify what you mean when you say universities are well positioned to help you with these legal agreements? Uh, I mean, I think that, so I guess point being, you don't need to do it on your own. There's usually someone whose job it is to, to be involved in this process. And, uh, and uh, or at least that's been my experience. Maybe that's not always true. But I, I know at least in the case of MIT, I, I think that it's also useful for you because having that contract signed through the university sort of indemnifies you yeah. from legal risk. So if in the worst case scenario, something goes off the rails, the company gets really upset about something in the paper, even though you've agreed that you have the right to publish or something like that, um, you know, you sort of want the entity that they are uh, yeah. drawing their ire towards being the university and not you as an individual <laughs> person. Uh, so it's important to, to do this through the right channels. Yeah, you should definitely do it through the right channels, uh, which might be some sort of industry alliances office and legal and IRB. So that's three sites within one university that you might need to touch base with. But I just I think lawyers are lovely individuals. And it's just that they're not always it depends on what institution you're at, how, how familiar they are with these types of agreements. So they're going to flag for you all kinds of concerns that might cause you extreme amounts of panic or make you feel like the project won't move forward. And so I would just, I find, I, I thought that was stressful early on when I started. Um, yeah, I, I agree you, with you that just have, You just have to get through that. You just have to not care and be like, yeah, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Uh, and keep orienting people around like, this is what we're trying to do. What's the best way to get to what we're trying to do? Because their job is to, they're doing their job. It's just not always, it doesn't always make it easy to get the legal agreement done. Yeah, maybe another way to, to state this is that I think the lawyer's job is to highlight any potential risk and make you aware of it. And if you internalize yeah. all of those risks as being existential risks, it feels like there's a lot of yeah. them. Uh, but you can sort of, you know, on a case by case basis, sort of say, okay, I recognize that risk, but I think it's fine in this case or, or very unlikely or, or something. And I think maybe that's what Sanas means about a, a continuum as well, is that there are certain risks that maybe you say, you know, for this particular agreement, I, I see theoretically that this is a concern, but yes. I know I'm okay leaving that. Oh, Dave, that's super important because if you defer to everything your university lawyer says, it's like really unclear what you're going to be left over with. So you should feel the right to say, I don't think that's going to happen. I'm not worried about that. Let's move on to the next item. Um, I don't know if that was empowering yeah. through Zoom, but that was the point. <laughs> no, no, this is great. I'm, I think this is. I think this is a great time. Oh, that's a great time to transition more into the questions from the participants. So again, you can type your questions into the chat window, uh, or you can also use the Zoom raise hand feature to raise your hand and ask your question yourself. And I think um, I think it's been really wonderful for all of us to get to hear some of these behind the scenes challenges because i think a lot of times we see papers at the end of the process and pretty much everything you're talking about is not there like a lot of what we do as researchers ends up in the paper so we can learn from other people's papers but this is really a skill and an art that we seem to have to learn from people who have done it and, and shared with us can i Sorry, I know we're turning the questions. Can I just make one last point? Because it was on our agenda, but we didn't get to it. And it's about what makes a good partner. Um, and I, I guess I want to just talk for a second about the whole relationship. And it it's not a one-time transaction. So you really want to think about this person as like an ongoing collaborator, someone that you like interacting with, someone that you trust. And being transparent and communicating frequently has always helped me. If you have this mindset of like, we're not going to show you the results until six months and we don't want this, you know, the more like two way communication that there is where you're saying, this is what we're seeing in the data. Could you help us interpret it? And they're pushing back and, and up, you know, refining your understanding of the setting and the, the data that you have access to. That's always been better. Uh, so I just think that's the mindset you want to approach it with. Yeah, if I can have one last thing before we go to questions. I agree with what Sana has just said and would also add that showing preliminary results like that is helpful because it gives yeah. the partners a sense that they're getting some ROI on their investment. If, if you don't show them anything for two years, they will sort of feel like it's a one-sided transaction. Um, and then the only other thing I would add is just that 
given all of these large, uh, I guess, like fixed costs that we've described in terms of getting a collaboration set up, it's definitely advantageous to try to find a setting that you can just like repeatedly study and get multiple yeah. papers out of, and also potentially to try and scope the language of these agreements so that when you say what you're doing in the research, it's not this very specific thing that's just this one paper you want to write. Maybe try to use broader language that can describe, you know, three, four, or five papers that you could write in collaboration with a given company. And that way you don't have to go through a year of set of costs for every single paper that you want to write. Um, this might be obvious, but I think it, it can really help with no. productivity. And also, then you don't have to reacquaint yourself with the idiosyncrasies of every new data set and, and what's weird about the data. You kind of, you know, know what's going on in a given data set. Okay, so I have a question from the chat, and then I see Mark has raised his hand, so he'll go after I read this question from the chat. And then please, again, enter your questions into the chat or raise your hand. Uh, the question is from Doug. Uh, how do you motivate for a company what's in it for them if the collaboration doesn't directly come out of an existing project or internship? So this, I think, goes back to the very beginning stages of building this and what the process that you called calibration. Uh, how, how do you, what are things that you try to think about to understand how you can make the project seem exciting or helpful to to the partner, in addition to actually making it helpful and valuable to the partner? So uh, early on, I spend, my collaborators and I often spend a lot of time listening to the people at the client, at the company site, uh, trying to understand what their job is and what got them excited about possibly doing a collaboration and who they think in their organization would benefit from the, the results of the study and why, uh, like who is the information most useful to. Um, but I try to not be very specific. You know, I'm not making big promises like we're going to solve all your problems or we're going to develop a tool for you that's going to help you, you know, increase diversity by X percentage in Y days. Like that's not what we're after. It's uh, expectation management, I guess. Well, I don't often have, I never turn to the business case. You, you Dave used the word ROI. I kind of laughed. I try to avoid that. Um, it's a very hard to forecast uh, for in, in the kind of work that I'm doing. So it's mostly, it's mostly like at times we've said, oh, why don't we could put a master deck together for you that you could have, like, we'll give you a hundred slides with sort of the key points of what we did and the results. And then you'll be able to use that internally as you want. Or we offer to write a white paper, like we'll write the paper for publication, but then also write something broader that has like more in the methods and more about the data so that it can be distributed internally. Um, yeah, I wouldn't... I, I, I'm sorry, I, I thought you were done. No, go ahead. I just was gonna say, I wouldn't worry that much. Like other people will let you know if there's nothing in it for them. You don't need to worry so hard about that. Yeah, I, I, I should clarify that when I said ROI, I did not mean it in a strict <laughs> uh, business sense. I just meant, what are we getting out of this? Um, I do think though, even if you're not um, promising like a tangible return on the research, I think it can be useful to try to put yourself in the mindset of the people that you are soliciting and think about problems that might be salient to them. Uh, I, I guess I'm in a business school and so this comes a little bit more naturally for me, but maybe if you're a sociologist or, or something like that, you know, there, there are research papers that show, for instance, that diversity is associated with um, more productivity oh. or better, oh. earning, you know, like, <laughs> but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, nothing. You disagree. You disagree. Well, no, I, guess, I, I, like, I don't. I don't think it's a totally different panel. I don't think you have to. I don't think you should have to go there for the study of these topics. I think that's a problem in and of itself. It's a different panel. Yeah, I, I think that. I think just making it clear that what you're doing is not just some disconnected, uh, like academic exercise that has no relevance to them, but just sort of highlighting that it might actually be in their interests, and they maybe should be thinking about these topics, and and this is why uh can can help a lot um and so any opportunity to do that um i think will, will help your case um, yeah and 
also just remember you can't predict like how they're going to use it. So I had something where they, they all of a sudden we found out they were developing an internal tool that our results were going to inform like how they structured that tool. We had no idea that that was happening. So there's a lot that might be happening behind the scenes. I just say like I want to take the pressure off of you to figure out exactly how you're going to solve a problem for for your partner. Yeah, I wouldn't frame it as solving their problem. I would just say we can help you learn something about a problem that is maybe of interest to you. And I think what Sana's just brought up is, I guess, an interesting ethical consideration as well, which is not the question I was asked. But yeah, this is kind of, <laughs> this is, it's beyond the scope of what an IRB would normally review. But if you're working in collaboration with a, a firm, you know, in many cases, what you do, it's not just affecting the test subjects, but it might affect the trajectory of what large entities do. And these decisions might end up affecting a lot of people. And so I guess it's also worth thinking through, you know, kind of the ethics and the politics of these these partnerships when you're Can someone please ask a question about that in the chat so that we don't have to <laughs> don't have to talk so long like this. Sure. Uh, so again, please put questions in the chat. Uh, one of the panelists has very nicely requested a, a question about <laughs> ethics. So I hope it will it will drop into the chat soon. I see Mark has raised his hand. Uh, so let's go to Mark and then hopefully we'll have some questions in the chat or I will ask that question myself. Um, so Mark. Unmute. Mark. Yeah, okay. Oh, now I'm unmuted, okay. Yes. Uh, hi, thanks for, for being here and discussing these issues. Um, so I, I've been working on a project recently that has tried to, uh, has been focused on helping the city of Philadelphia. Uh, I, I'm a postdoc at UPenn. And um, one of the challenges that we constantly face is that the city has a lot of, uh, and this is related to COVID, like there's COVID things and they're like, maybe you guys can help us with some data problems. Um, and one of the challenges we face is that they have a lot of like very specific needs and interests. They came to us, so it was sort of not us <laughs> driving a research agenda. Um, and it's been quite tricky for us to um, find things sort of outside of what they're interested in at any one time uh, that have sort of broader research goals for us. So it feels often like we're working sort of as data scientists for them. Um, and, you know, we're, we're working hard to <laughs> avoid that being a problem. So like we're doing a bunch of modeling and some other interesting research side stuff. Um, but I, I wonder if that's ever been an issue in, in examples that you've faced. Like, ha has it ever felt like you're sort of becoming uh, a pawn for the company or, or maybe a part of the company? Um, and is there anything that you've thought about to, to sort of avoid that becoming too much of a problem? And I, I made that sound bad. It's not anywhere near as bad as <laughs> I might have made it sound. It's actually quite fine and they're very nice people, but it's just been a, a concern for us. Like, how do we make sure that we're making research progress? Um, yeah, I, I think that this is tough. I mean, I, I've definitely been in situations where, you know, I, I think this can happen. I, I guess the cases where I've seen this happen the most, and it sounds like in a way this describes your case as well, is you're working on something that they're really interested in. And so, and is it really selling a problem for them? And so they want, you know, they, they sort of want help with it. Um, I think I've tried to always keep view of the longer term goal and do the research that I want to do. But if along the way, there are like plots or descriptive statistics or something like that, that I would find maybe not that important, but might be really high value to them, I'll send it along. And this is kind of a version of, of what Sanaz was talking about, I think, of just keeping them informed is I think as academics, we think so much about the, the final paper and what that's supposed to look like. We don't appreciate sometimes that these intermediate results can be really valuable for people and sharing them can be uh, can be useful. Um, I uh, One thing that I meant to say earlier and I forgot is I do know at least at MIT, one thing that the lawyers have highlighted when I've been working through these various um, contracts is that uh, I think they explicitly don't want MIT affiliates to be in a situation where there's any sort of like quid pro quo. So they don't I, I think they are trying to avoid a situation where it's like, you'll give us the data for a paper and then we'll do X thing for you. Like if anything, the deliverable should be a report or a white paper, like like Sun has said. But I, I think um, in like a softer sense, I think that it can still be helpful to sometimes realize that if you do a little favor for someone and like do something with the data that they ask, it can buy you some, you know, sort of like political goodwill 
to achieve what you're trying to do with the data. Um, but I, I think it's really hard. And I think there's definitely a theoretical, um, you know, circumstance where you sort of have to draw a line and say, hey, you know, this isn't really in the purview of what I'm trying to do with the data. Um, thankfully, I, I've never really been put in that situation, but I, I think that contingency does exist. So thank you, Mark. Uh, so Naz had a question about ethics. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about ethics. I guess it's a very broad question. Um, it could go a lot of different ways. I'm wondering what, what how do you think about ethics in, in this part of your research? So I guess I just wanted to make space for the conversation that these kinds of collaborations are new and it's not clear who is best positioned to like review it or oversee it or sort of look at it from every angle. So IRB in my experience is not always, that's not really their scope. And in some cases you might not actually be interacting with people directly, you might just be getting archival data. So in that case, it's not even really like IRB isn't gonna spend a lot of time helping you think through it. The lawyers aren't gonna help you think through it. And it's not clear that the lawyers at the company side who are interested in protecting the company or their like the risk to their brand or to their, to their product, like it's, it's sort of unclear. In my case, I'm studying people and I'm never sure who's actually concerned about the people whose behavior I'm studying in a de-identified way. Um, so I think it's just worth, like you may have checked every box, but you should still spend time asking yourself, like what am I actually building here? What's going to be done with it? What are its potential uses? Um, What's the consent situation here? What's the expectation? I mean, there's just a lot of considerations and I just wanna say that it really falls on you and your collab and like the, on the research team to, to think about it. It's not anyone else's responsibility and it's additional work. So it's gonna take a, a extra time, but I think you'll feel better and you'll have less anxiety if in case anything happens as you move forward the, with the project, uh, if you take the time to do that early on. There's also, I guess, like an even earlier ethical question, which is that by engaging with firms to do research, and I think I maybe mentioned this in passing earlier, but you know, you're sort of tacitly deciding that the the papers that you can work on are sort of uh, informed by what questions these companies are going to be interested in, in answering yeah. themselves. And so, you know, there might be things that are just kind of beyond the scope of what they are willing to do for any variety of reasons. And, you know, I guess that's something that every person kind of needs to decide on their own, but some people might decide that they don't want their research agenda to be at all constrained by, you know, outside entities that, you know, might have different interests than they do. So that's something we're thinking about as well, is maybe you're just someone that doesn't want to go down this path for that, for that re high level reason. Yeah. So we One Oh, sorry. Just one great solution is in these partnerships to have like two or three uh, people who work at the company, if you're actually studying an organizational site that you can use that that are part of the project, but they act as informal consultants or liaisons that you can run things by and say, like, how would you feel if you knew that this your conference calls were getting listened in on? That's not happening. But that was an example. Uh, don't worry, that's yeah. not happening. So, um, uh, we just have like uh, two or three minutes left. I, I want to thank Sanaz and Dave for sharing so much with us. I also would like to, they told us a lot about their, the difficulties and challenges that they face as researchers. Um, and um, But they continue to do this kind of work that involves partnering with companies. Um, so I think it's important for us to hear about the challenges and they've been gracious in sharing that. I wonder if as a kind of wrap up, if you could talk a little bit about why you continue to do this kind of research, given all of the things that you've told us about the difficulties and the lawyers and the searching for partners and so on. So maybe to wrap up a little bit about um, why this is an exciting direction to move in. Dave, do you sure. want to go first? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I think the way that I think about it is there is, uh, you know, as I said earlier, there are certain questions that you just couldn't study with an industry collaborator because they, they either won't do it or couldn't do it for ethical reasons. Um, on the flip side, there are a lot of um, questions that would be really hard, if not impossible, 
to study without working with industry collaborators. And, you know, having the possibility of answering those questions is really exciting. So, uh, you know, if you want to learn about platform design and mechanism design and online markets, as I do, um, it's really difficult for me to spin up my own, you know, <laughs> online platform with hundreds of thousands of participants. And so being able to get data from one that already exists or to be able to run an experiment with one that already exists um, opens up a lot of possibilities that previously would not be available. Um, and when you actually get the data, I know Sanez and I talked a lot about how the data is often messy or is really hard to work with, but it is really just unbelievably rich data um, that allows you to gain insight into a number of things that would previously have been really hard, um, especially, I know Matt talks about this a lot in his book, but you know, you have all this digital trace data that kind of allows you to answer questions that maybe previously you would have had to ask through surveys and things like that. And maybe the trace data is more reliable in some ways than that survey data. Um, I guess one thing that I just want to say, and then I'll let Sana's way in too, is that one issue with this is that as we've sort of mentioned, a lot of access to this data in these companies is sort of mediated by being part of these networks and, and having access to these people. And insofar as publishing, you know, uh, sort of like uh, these really exciting papers depends on having access to this data. It does kind of create a market um, for like academic success that is sometimes not as guided by, you know, the caliber of your work as it should be, but just who was able to get access to data. Uh, and that can be kind of unfortunate. So that's like a whole uh, separate kind of issue maybe with this model that we haven't had time to talk about, but is I think worth thinking about as a academic community, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I agree with like Dave, everything you said. I would, I study organizations. I'm ultimately in the, like in my lifetime of doing research, I hope I can affect change or influence change inside of organizations that changes how, what work feels like for people. Um, so this is, I love doing this work. I think some of the most exciting parts are like you read these papers in your area and then you go look at data and you're like this result is here too this results maps this result doesn't i mean it really brings everything that you're studying alive and it gives you a good intuition for the phenomena um, better than in my experience other types of projects uh, and I have learned just a huge amount from the people I work with inside of the company they've been in some ways like second I don't know, committee members when I was in grad school because uh, there, there's a lot of intuition or knowledge that isn't conveyed through formal documentation. Um, I would say that that has been huge for my learning and for my ability, like even research-wise to understand what problem areas to focus on or what research streams are more interesting to pursue or not. All of that is getting informed and filtered by what I'm seeing at these organizational sites. So I'm super grateful for that. Cool. All right. Well, that, I think that's a great note to end on. So I want to uh, thank Sanaz and Dave. Please join me um, for sharing their wisdom about the challenges and the opportunities that exist. I think we can see this is really uh, a very exciting area. Um, and if we can learn how to navigate these many challenges, it will create a lot of exciting research possibilities. So thank you, Sanaz and Dave.